Hello. So today I want to talk to you about uh, loading and saving things from storage. Now, several ways to save data in Code 1. Storage is the most portable and probably the simplest for better and for worse in terms of the ways to save data in Code Name 1. So let's do a simple thing. Let's start by creating a simple user interface so we can actually play with storage. So first, I'm going to place a label, and this label is going to be called data. And then I'm going to place a text field which I, whose contents I'm going to store. And the next thing, I'm going to add two buttons. The first one is save, and the second one is load. And if you, what I'm going to do here is save into storage, and what I'm going to do here is load the data from storage. Really simple. And the text field, I'm going to call it text. So that's really simple. Let's save this, obviously. And let's start by creating action events for every one of these things. So the first thing we need to create an event for saving, and then we need to create an event for loading. Here's pi. Now, we have here both uh, methods. On the first one, we want to save the data. So that's pretty easy. All we need to do is uh, save the entry. So let's find the text. Find text. And that returns the text field. And we can give it C as since uh, accept any component within the same tree as uh, to work with. And uh, we can get the text like that. Now the reason this works is C is the button and it finds the text field that is in the same container hierarchy as the button. That's really easy. So here we have the text. Now the simplest thing we can do is actually create storage object and get instance obviously and write object give it the name saved data and just write the text uh, string. Now that would be really useful but if all we want to do is, is store a string we can also use something like the preference API. And here we can use uh, put set for instance and just uh, give uh, something like a preference name like AAA and give it the name and the text we want to save and that that's just helps me store a single line of text but in this particular sample where we just store one one line of text it's not very interesting but if we want to store lots of data we can use a vector and you can use a vector you can use a hash table you can use any sort of data and just place strings into that data or integers or whatever type of basic primitive type you want. You can nest vectors and vectors and hash tables and hash tables and build any sort of data structure you want. So I can create a vector of strings like this and create, create it like that. And then I can, instead of storing just the text, I can store so any number of texts. In this particular case, I'm only storing one because I'm. Uh, I want to show you uh, the concept of how it works. But generally, I can store as many as I want. So now, what we need to do is implement uh, the load uh, function. So to implement this, uh, we do effectively the same thing in reverse, which means we load the data vector from the storage. As such and instead of writing the object and giving it like that we read the object like this now I need to downcast it because the return value for this method is object so it can be technically anything now keep in mind you can nest vectors one into another this can be a vector string like this or you can do things like a hash table string String like this, and you can store any other data of that right here. So that's really useful. Now, if vec isn't null, we're making sure because the first time it can be null, and this is just for good measure. 
uh, then we find the data, and this is the important portion, based on C, and set the text to uh, the first element in the vector. Then we go to C's component form, and we revalidate. So everything is updated and laid out again. So otherwise, we won't necessarily see everything on the screen. So once we did that, we can just press play. And we can just type anything here, save it, and then it's loaded. And that's really cool. That's just basic storage working for you. Now, say you want to save an arbitrary object. For instance, uh, let's call it uh, uh, my object. So my object has a very complex structure in this particular case. It's got one string, x, uh, in it. And you want to save my object to storage. I'll add a getter and setter for x uh, by encapsulating it like this. And I'd like this to be saved. I'd like this to be serializable. So we don't support serialization because of reflection costs and everything like that. But we do support uh, externalization. So all I need to do is implement the externalizable interface from codename 1. That's very important, not from job.io. And once I do that, I need to override several methods. The first one is the version. This is really for your sake, where you can essentially define any version and later on when you externalize or internalize, do things based on that particular version when you internalize. So the next thing you need to do is define the object ID. So in this case, you need to give it my object. Now, this is very important. Don't do something like clever, like get class, get name. This won't work. This section, that won't work. And the reason for that is that code is obfuscated and a class name might not exist in runtime in the same way. That's why even if this is identical to this right now, it won't be that on the device. And that's, that's critical that you use it in this particular way. So in the in an externalized method, all we need to do is write the string and then read the string. Now, you can do the simple thing like write UTF, which seems like the right thing. It isn't, because x can be null, and in this case, that will fail. So a simpler thing to do is to use our utils, which contain lots of things like that, like uh, uh, write UTF or all sorts of other elements like that. And uh, for primitive types, it's not a big deal, but for strings, that's much easier. And then if you do that, you need to do the same in the read UTF. Okay, and the reason for that is that we write essentially a boolean first, saying if it's null or not, and only then write the string. So you need to read it differently as well. So that's it. That's the externalizable object, but you need to do one more thing. You need to register that object so we will be aware of that. So the last piece of the puzzle is calling register and giving it the name that you gave earlier and my object, like that. Now the reason for this is that if the object is stored, we need to be aware of it when reading it. And we can't use class loading because the not name of the class might be obfuscated in runtime. So this allows us to actually identify the object in runtime. And it's crucial that this happens before you actually try to read the object. Now we can change the, the code to use this new structure. So instead of saving the vector, as we did here, we can essentially create my object O. And obviously, that object can be anything. Uh, you set x, give it. And now instead of storing, you can store it in a vector, or you can store it uh, independently. I'll store it in, independently because I'm lazy here. Yeah? And the same goes to the read section. And I'm going to cast to my object as such. And this no longer becomes, uh, this becomes O, for instance. And here I'll just check against null, which might be.
mo.get x like this. And now this will work exactly the same. So if we'll run this hello world instead of the last, or together with the last as I'm running it right here, we'll see that if I type this in and save and then load, this works exactly the same with an arbitrary object, not necessarily a vector or a string or anything like that, an arbitrary object. So I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and learned a bit about storage. I hope you'll read a bit more about that in our developer guide and join us in our discussion forum for questions and uh, general discussion suggestions and everything. And also check out our other ways of storing data. So thank you for watching and uh, see you in the next tutorial.